Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that burns fat while you sleep. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about device security. This is from N10-004, section 6.5. We need to explain issues that affect device security. So there's physical security, there's restricting local and remote access to our network, and there are some methodologies that are secure and some that are unsecure. And we're going to talk about the different applications and the different protocols and why they're secure and why they're unsecure. If you thought the Network Plus exam was all about networks, you may be surprised to find it's also about door locks. And physical security is an important part of this. If you have physical access to a server on the network or almost any device, you can compromise it. There's a method that you can use to get in, change the master password, access the core of the system, take out a hard drive, any one of those things. So the physical security of devices becomes extremely important for what you're doing in your environment. One of the things that you'll also see is that Laptops are very mobile. Phones are very mobile. It's sometimes very easy for somebody to come into our environment and be able to take a laptop with them, be able to take a phone with them. These devices are getting very small these days. And so having physical security is also going to protect the assets that are inside of your organization. Physical access, although I mentioned door locks, it's much more than door locks. It also deals with the policies and procedures you set up when someone comes on board in your organization. Do they get an access card? Do they have access to certain parts of the network? Do they have access to certain parts of the building? Uh, what about guest access when somebody comes in from somewhere else? Do we have to always make sure we're with them when they're in the environment? Do they only have access to certain parts of the building? And then how do you monitor those locks? How do you make sure that nobody props a door open? I was in one environment where we were preparing for a seminar, and the doors propped open because it was locked all the time. It was nobody there at the moment. We propped it open because we were expecting some others to show up and help set up. And we got a phone call in the room, and it was actually a monitoring facility on the other side of the country that said, you propped the door open. You need to close the door. They're monitoring those things and making sure nobody can come in and take anything that's in there because someone had propped the door open and allow anybody they'd like to walk in and out of the building. There are many ways to restrict access into and out of the network. We talked about one of these on our previous module with 802.1x, where it's a very standardized way to make sure that people have to authenticate before they even get onto the network. And you see this whether it's a wired network or a wireless network. It really doesn't matter. We still must make sure that we authenticate people before they have access to these resources. You can see with many operating systems, there's also authentication based around the Kerberos standards. Very open methodology to be able to provide access to uh, resources that are on the network, uh, areas of hard drives, printers, whatever you'd like to provide them with resource access, Kerberos is a very good way to do that. If somebody's coming in from outside, they're probably going to want to have remote access through a VPN. And a virtual private network is a great way to do that. You can build up a tunnel using IPsec. You can create web-based SSL VPN or very small client-based SSL VPNs. Your remote access piece may also include two-factor authentication. You may need a pseudo-random token generator that somebody takes along with them that they must have that token generator if they want to log in. And with mobile devices, it becomes even more of a challenge. I'm carrying a phone now. It's a smartphone all the time. I want to be sure the communication between my phone and my internal network is always encrypted. And those types of things are becoming more and more standard on these mobile technologies. We are moving from a network with unsecure protocols to one that is much more secure these days. Unsecure protocols are protocols where the traffic between applications is wide open in the clear. There's no encryption there. I could put a Wireshark that I downloaded for free on my laptop, plug it into the network link between two devices, and see every email that's sent back and forth, see every bit of text going back and forth all in the clear. We don't want that. We want to use protocols that are secure. So before we talk about what's secure, let's talk about unsecure protocols, something like Telnet. This is how I can get a remote terminal session on another machine, but everything is sent in the clear, including your username and password. This is not something you should be using on anybody's network these days. Another very unsecure protocol is HTTP. Most of the websites we go to, if we're reading the mail on a large website, we're looking at what's happening in the news. We may not care so much that that is unsecure. If we do go and read our mail, we may want to use something other than HTTP to do that. We'll talk about what we'll use in a moment. But if it is a browser-based communication using HTTP, it's all in the clear. I can read every bit of it. 
The FTP file transfer protocol is also a way to transfer files between systems, but again, it's not encrypting anything. If somebody was sitting in the middle, they could collect all of those packets and rebuild the file just by sitting in the middle passively and watching the traffic go by. You certainly don't want that. Remote shell is RSH. This allows us to run commands to other machines over the network. Usually not used these days for its inherent security risks, and because all of this happens in an unsecure method where nothing is encrypted, then that's not something we want to run either. Usually if we're running processes across the network, those have a pretty important username and password associated with them. RCP is called remote copy. It allows us to copy files across the network, but just like FTP, it's all in the clear. I can see everything. So RCP is not something we should use and expect that it's going to be very secure. And lastly, SNMP version 1 and version 2 allow us to manage infrastructure devices. We can look at statistics of throughput on devices or other statistics inside of these infrastructure devices that we have and gather those stats. But it's all done also all in the clear. There's nothing private or secure about SNMP version 1 or SNMP version 2. These days, it's important to use secure protocols to be able to do that. And one common way of encrypting and using secure protocols is something called SSH. Before, we talked about Telnet as being this wide open terminal that anybody could read your username and password. SSH is a secure shell where you can't understand the username and password. It is an encrypted channel between those two devices. So a very nice secure protocol to use. If you're on a website and you would like to read your mail, you would like to use HTTPS. That is secure HTTP. If you ever see the lock at the bottom of your browser, if it's unlocked, you're using HTTP. If it's locked, then you're using HTTPS. And so you'll know it's encrypted. Every time you see that lock and it's in place, that is an encrypted link between you and that web server. SNMP version 3, we talked about SNMP version 1 and 2 on the last slide. Version 3 came out and said, you know what? We should be encrypting this stuff. We should be much more secure with how we're sending this information back and forth to our infrastructure devices. And simple network management protocol version 3 does exactly that. SFTP allows us to do remote file management, and it uses the SSH protocol to do this. So now I can really manage my files. I can upload files, get a listing of files, download files. It is all encrypted. Nobody can go into those files and rebuild them after the fact. And lastly, SCP, which is a simplified way to just copy files. And that copy methodology also uses SSH. SSH is a really nice, well-made, robust way to encrypt data back and forth. So it makes sense these other applications applications would take advantage of that secure shell protocol. Let's review what we've learned about device security. Our first question is, what security component can address unauthorized visitors in secure areas of a building? Well, that would be our physical access. We want to be sure we know where our visitors to the building are at all times. And if they're going into a secure area, we need to know the policies and procedures for that. Next question, what common encrypted tunnel is used for remote access to a network? Well, a very common encrypted tunnel to be able to do that is something called a virtual private network, or a VPN. It becomes extremely useful when you're trying to get remote access somewhere but still be secure. And lastly, which is more secure, Telnet or SSH? If you recall from our listing of protocols, you'll know that secure shell, SSH, is certainly the most secure you can have of those two, Telnet being completely in the clear. This uh, is now our device security module. We've come to the end of N10-004, section 6.5, where we've looked at physical security, our remote access functionality, how we can secure and have unsecure protocols and recognize those and keep everything on our network as secure as possible. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to see many more Network Plus videos, participate in our message boards and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.